Welcome to Up to the Minute. I'm Todd Duplantis. Glad to have you with us on the show. Hey, the weather just keeps getting better. It's beautiful outside. Uh, beautiful day. Hashtag, it's finally Friday. And, and if you didn't know, Frank Cooper's back on the show. He's here every Friday. And Frank, it's a perfect day outside. It is. It's football weather, man. It's, it's the, the fall season slowly rolling in. You know, this is the, the part of the year where I can just walk around and not have to not to sweat bullets from the summertime with the humidity of, of, of Blake to Houston, Texas. So this, this, is, this is a welcome addition. It is. It's a perfect day outside. Now, if you're just tuning in, we've got your HCC news and information coming up in the next half hour. Got some special guests who are going to join us. Uh, we're back on HCC TV, by the way. Uh, we're on at noon and 5 p.m. every weekday. You can watch the rebroadcast of the show and you can catch us live here Every morning, Mondays through Fridays, when HCC is in session at uh, live at 10 a.m. We're also across all social media, Frank. Absolutely. So we're streaming live on YouTube right now, Facebook as well. So for all the latest episodes on YouTube, just go to youtube.com, HCC uh, up to the minute, hit the notification bell for all the latest episodes. We're also on uh, LinkedIn as well and Instagram. So, you know, let's grow the show. All right, Frank, stick around. A lot of sports things happening. Hey, by the way, the Astros are in the playoffs. They're already up one nothing. We'll talk about that and more coming up later in the show. Uh, let's see. We got a couple of special guests this morning. Uh, we're continuing our celebration of Hispanic Heritage Month, and we've got Dr. Samantha Rodriguez. She is with the U.S. and America, Mexican American History and is out of HCC Southeast College. Good morning to you, Dr. Rodriguez. Good morning. We're looking forward to talking with you and hearing more from you in a few moments. So if you would, grab a cup of coffee, stick around. We'll be with you in about 10 minutes. Okay, we're going to kick things off right now. Uh, welcoming back to the show, Jenny Waldo, the program coordinator in our filmmaking department with the Media, Visual, and Performing Arts, COE. And uh, Jenny, welcome back to the show. Before we have had a chance to talk to you uh, in the past, we spoke about your movie you were uh, working on called Acid Test. Uh, where is that now and how's it going with the movie? Yeah, well, thanks for having me back. Uh, Acid Test, uh, which started out as a short film, uh, turned into a feature film, and it is now premiering at two festivals uh, and one in our great state of Texas. So uh, cool. it will be premiering at the Austin Film Festival. Uh, we are screening October 24th and uh, the 28th, which is huge. Austin is a, is a big, I mean, obviously it's a big film town, but the Austin yeah. Film Festival itself is a really great festival. Uh, and we'll also be screaming, streaming digitally with the Twin Cities um, Film Festival in Minnesota. So, And this is a pretty big deal with this film. I know you've been working on it for quite some time. For those who may not be familiar with it, it's somewhat of a coming of age story. And is it a personal story for you? Yes, it's a personal story. Uh, it's based on, you know, hijinks from my youth. Um, and it's... Uh, it, it is set in 1992. It's, uh, it's you know, about a, you know, teenage girl. Uh, we cast a Latina actress. So, you know, it's nice to fit in with the uh, Heritage Month. But, uh, yeah, so it was, um, it, it's about a teenage girl struggling with, you know, impending adulthood, where to go to college. Uh, she gets inspired by Riot Girl music, which is this kind of aggressively uh, feminist punk music. And, uh, you know, yeah. she's got some home struggles. She drops LSD. That's why it's called acid test. So, you know, it's it's just kind of a, a family drama. I mean, the core of the story really is about the family and the coming of age. And you had a number of our students work on it as well, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, both the short film and the feature film, we had students work on it. But for the feature film, they actually earned college credit. So it was really wonderful uh, we've done this with a couple of projects where we create a special class uh, and they were able to substitute it for their capstone project. So they really uh, were able to network with uh, industry professionals that are here locally, get some great, you know, onset experience. So it was really wonderful. I've always wondered about telling your, your, your own story. I, you know, I am so grateful that when I grew up, we didn't have social media. <laughs> None of us had 
cell phone cameras. None of us had cell phones when I was growing up as well. And uh, that I, I'm thinking that was good. It was fortunate. But when you look back and you're telling the story from your perspective, obviously you want to base it on facts and things that have happened. But do you tend to uh, maybe embellish a bit? Do you tend to stretch the things or create things as you remember it as opposed to as they were? How does that work? Yeah, it's definitely a fine balance. And we we struggled or I struggled writing it. Uh, we actually did a, a table read workshop where we invited an audience to come to HCC uh, to the soundstage that we have at the A-Leaf campus. And uh, we read the, the script aloud with our actors and they gave us feedback on what was working, what wasn't working. In truth, all of this stuff that happens within the two hour movie is yes, based on true story, but it is embellished. Some of the things yeah. are more than they were in real life. Some of the things are less because uh, sometimes the whole, you know, truth is stranger than fiction applies where nobody's really going to believe <laughs> what actually happened, you know? So it, you have to work within the confines of narrative structure and what's working narratively. And they really do become characters in my mind. You know, it's, it is my story, but it's no longer mine, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. You know, I always wonder about these um, these biopics, especially when uh, they're written about a person. For example, you know, if you look back at Bohemian uh, Rhapsody, you know, wonderful movie, very entertaining. But what would a Freddie Mercury have thought of that? You know, and um, I know being a Queen uh, history buff and knowing a lot about music, uh, things were told not in chronological order and they didn't happen the way they did in the movie. You know, uh, certain songs didn't pop up in parts in their career. But um, um, you got to wonder what the subjects think about them if they look back at, wow, life really was that way then, or if they're thinking, yeah, that was all just a writer. Yeah, it's it's impossible to condense somebody's life story into two hours. I mean, you couldn't even do it for a television series. It just, there's too, too much and too many things that don't fit the narrative. Um, and so it it is really... It is interesting. It's you kind of have to approach it as what is the most important kind of story aspect to tell, um, and and what are the themes that you're working with? You know, kind of what's the message to a certain degree? Right. Yeah. Tell us about what's coming after the festivals. Um, and I understand you also have a new uh, feature film script that you're working on. Yeah. So uh, speaking of other true stories, I have a feature film script that is also based on another true story. It's not my story. It's about a woman in Baytown, Texas, who owns uh, an auto body shop. And uh, back in 1994, when uh, the Houston Rockets made their first NBA uh, final run, uh, she ended up getting in a bit of hot water with the city because she had refurbished an old Mustang uh, painted it this kind of brightly purple color and um, planted flowers in it and stuck it under her sign and uh, apparently was in violation of Baytown's junk car ordinance. And so she had to like sue the city and it became this kind of thing. Uh, people were writing in support letters and all this stuff. So uh, I met, you know, I met this woman, I've been uh, talking with her and her family and the people involved. Uh, and so I created a script that I sent to the Nickel Fellowship, which is sponsored or run by the Academy, which hands out all the Oscars. So it's, it's essentially the top screenwriting uh, competition in the world. And uh, I got the quarterfinalist placement, which... It was something out of like 8,000 applicants. I was in the top 300. So it was quite quite a, an accomplishment. I'm really excited about it. So I'm trying to see and hopefully develop that as my second feature. Uh, with Acid Test, you know, we're going to run the festivals. You know, this is kind of the start of our festival season. We hope to see where it goes from here. And then eventually... The idea is to attract a distributor who will put it on platforms like Netflix or Hulu or something like that, where the broader public can engage with it. So, Are you um, obviously still very entrenched with classes here at HCC? <laughs> and uh, have you uh, have you returned in person yet with uh, with your classes? 
Yeah, this week was my first in-person uh, class. I'm teaching three classes. Uh, we have the film classes are all long classes, so they're about four hours long. And uh, I'm only teaching one scheduled in-person class. So that's my directing class. Uh, and it was it was fun. It was kind of strange to be back uh, in, you know, going through the motions that yeah. I remember from two years ago. So, yeah. Well, if you're interested in our film program, are you guys enrolling for the spring right now? Uh, I don't think registration is live just yet, but we have definitely just put together the spring schedule. Where, right. So, yeah, definitely we have a, a full, we offer an associate's degree in filmmaking, but we also offer one-year certificates in editing, screenwriting, and general production. Uh, you can also get a two-year certificate, which is the same as the associates, except without the core. Um, so, yeah, definitely uh, reach out to either me or my chair, Michael Cohen, and we can uh, set you up with information and a tour of our facilities. We've got a great, great campus down at Ailey's. Yeah, and our spring registration will be getting underway very shortly. We're about a few weeks away from that. Well, you'll hear all about it. But we're going to put some links to uh, Jenny's programs and uh, our film programs in our social media post for the show. And if you want to sign up and get Jenny as your professor, keep in mind those classes are very small. We were into smaller classes now because of the social distancing thing. So make sure you sign up early to get the right classes that you want for the spring. Jenny, thanks for being here and updating us on all the good things you have going on. Good luck in the film festival. And thanks. next time we hope to hear more about Martha's Mustang. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate it and have a great Friday. All right. Have a good Friday. Okay. We're going to move on and talk right now with Dr. Samantha Rodriguez. She's an HCC Histories and Humanities professor with a focus on U.S. and Mexican-American history. Good morning. Welcome back to welcome to the show, I should say. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's talk about uh, an overview of Hispanic Heritage Month and what that means to you and the programs and the classes and the, the courses that you teach. Well, um, Hispanic Heritage Month, and, and I always like to bring up local history. So for Houston, they really started being celebrated in the 1920s when the population became so big that those kind of festivities were warranted. And so when that happened, um, they kind of focused more on uh, dramas and parades, things of that nature. But later on in the 1970s, when Hispanic Heritage Month was really being recognized, being pushed to be recognized, um, they would focus on issues of discrimination and police brutality. So for me, um, Hispanic Heritage Month not only is a way to honor Latina, Latino history, which some people refer to it as, Latino, Latino History Month, but also as a way of kind of having community cohesion, as a way of community members to come together to celebrate, to honor their history. Let's, uh, I've got in my notes here, we want to talk about the fight for community cohesion in the 60s and 70s. And I remember in this still, uh, I still remember this today because when I moved to Houston, I moved here from New Orleans and it was in the late 70s. Um, and it was right around the time that there was a, uh, a problem with the Houston Police Department and uh, Latinos, especially after they arrested one man and uh, he was found in the bayou. Handcuffs. Jose Campos Torres. Exactly, exactly. And I know uh, there was a lot of uh, feedback from that and blowback. And the community didn't just didn't trust the police. Here's the thing now. Are we kind of going through that, what, 40, 45 years later with community not trusting authorities um, because of other events that have happened? I mean, it seems like we have history. Things get a little bit better and they repeat it and it repeats itself again. Is that something you see as well? Uh, well, I mean, there have been some issues. I mean, obviously, during the pandemic, we witnessed people marching. Right. And yeah. uh, not only for George Floyd, but also for other members who had uh, kind of endured police brutality. And those members, you know, in Houston, they included, you know, members of the Latino community as well. Sure. Um, not only representing, you know, that solidarity with African-American community, but also their own issues. Um, they recently had a no bill for a mental health situation with the police, uh, Nicholas Chavez. And uh, that kind of stirs some emotions among folks who, once again, go back to that question of, are police the best people to respond to a mental health 
sure. situation. Yeah, right. So in those ways. Right. And let's talk about um, Tejanas, because I know um, you have a theme, Tejana feminism and ethnic uh, ethnic self-determination during the Chicana, Chicano movement. Um, is this a theme that you've written about or you discuss in your courses? Well, I do discuss it in my courses, but I uh, it's my dissertation. And actually, it's been published in two uh, works, one with a co-authored piece, that features uh, Maria Jimenez, and it's in the book Chicana Movidas. I also have featured this work in an upcoming anthology entitled uh, Civil Rights in Black and Brown, uh, which actually I was a part of a great project where we interviewed hundreds of people throughout the state of Texas to kind of get at what the brown and black civil rights movement was. Um, so particularly for my work in Tahanas, you know, I kind of focus on, you know, obviously during the Chicano movement, uh, most people are aware or many people are aware of the fact that this was done like a heyday civil rights movement for Mexican Americans and Latinos in general. Um, but for women, it was not only fighting for issues of racial discrimination, but gender discrimination as well. And that's pretty much what my research focuses on. Let's talk about Tejanas being involved in the political arena, because mm -hmm. that seems to be uh, very prominent right now. Um, but how did that come about? Uh, you talked about cohesion in the 60s and 70s. Is this something that came about because of that, what happened in the 60s and 70s? So that plays a major role. Obviously, you know, um, Mexican Americans and Latinos have been politically active um, before the 60s and 70s. But in these years, you really see women um, being represented. Um, women particularly were um, kind of, fought, you know, very active in the La Raza Unida Party. It was a third party. It was a time where people didn't really see the Democratic or the Republican Party representing their interests. And so they wanted to push for a change. And in this party, the interesting aspect is a lot of women were candidates. They, they ran for local positions. Um, and so some of them ran for city council, state board of education, state representatives. One notable one in Houston was Maria Jimenez. Um, and some of them, like Maria Jimenez, she only got like 17% of the vote when she ran in 1974. But for them, it wasn't about winning per se. It was about changing the political climate. Right. So in other words, it was kind of introducing the idea, or not just introducing, but reinforcing the idea in the Latina, Latino community about we should be politically active. We should be voting. We should be holding our representatives accountable. Um, but even more than that, they really changed the political structure because they were the first ones to do block walking door-to-door -door grassroots organizing, which is so key to political organizing now. But back then they were really doing that, really kind of reaching out to community at that time. If you could put yourself um, in the shoes of some of the Latinas or Tejanas back in the 60s and 70s who were fighting for equality, fighting to get into the political arena, and what would they say about having the fact that Judge Lena Hidalgo is one of the most powerful individuals in Harris County, um, second or, or online with the mayor of Houston, you know, um, obviously back in the 60s and 70s, do you think that was in the back of people's minds as they were trying to move forward in life? I think it was something they were definitely aspiring towards, right? And a lot of these women's efforts, because they, they also would put on conferences they had a caucus within the Raza Unida Party called the Mujeres por la Raza, Women for the People. And they basically would organize all of these conferences where they would tell women, this is how you run as political candidates. This is how you do it. This is the information. These are the questions you're starting to ask yourself, conscious raising, et cetera. And to be honest with you, um, Maria Jimenez actually mentored Lena Hidalgo. Wow. So she actually has, has a direct relationship with these women yeah. who were political candidates in the 70s. She's learned from the best on how to get there, huh? Right. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, finally, you know, I want to ask you um, how Tejanas were dedicated to, to creating community institutions that would preserve Mexican-American, Latina, Latino history. How did that come about? 
So one of the major players in that is Marta Cotera. She wrote a couple of works. Um, one was called The Chicana Feminist. The other one was called Dia, Diosa y Embra. And her biggest task was setting up this research center. It was called the Chicana Resource and Learning Center. And she gathered all these materials. It was like a database before Google, right? Before all of these other things. It was like the first primary databases. And she made it a point to use that information to help create um, the information for the Centers for Mexican American Studies. Otherwise, you know, in Houston, that was fought on the behalf of several students at the University of Houston. Um, but all of these efforts kind of culminated into this bigger fight for ethnic studies. And that is kind of reflective now in ACC. ACC yeah. has, you know, several certificate programs. They have an African-American certificate program. I mean, certificate they get. And then also a Mexican-American certificate that can the students can get. But in addition to that, they have a revived um, Puente program which um, is also called The Bridge, and it yeah. seeks to use cultural relevancy in order to foster student success. And there's been a, a few um, kind of studies about this, one of which was a very prominent Stanford study that came out and, you know, definitely in support of the idea that these um, students do, in fact, benefit from having cultural relevancy in the classroom. Well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the Puente program because we're currently at HCC TV working on a video with some of the students from that awesome. program. So we'll be uh, looking forward to getting that out there so you can learn all about that in uh, the next month or so um, in our social media and on HCC TV. Dr. Samantha Rodriguez, thanks for being here this morning and uh, enlightening us with some great discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, we're going to move on to uh, Frank Cooper, who is, uh, is Frank around? Did he go get cereal? You know, um, his camera's turned off, so I, the only I thing I can imagine. Trying to turn my camera. <laughs> okay, all right, I was thinking yeah. he went and got breakfast. <laughs> Serial time for Frank. Uh, Frank, thanks for being joining us once again. Um, Want to go through a few news and announcements, and we got a little bit of sports to talk about. But uh, Green Thumb Gardening, that's going on uh, Monday, coming up. Indeed no? it is. Okay. It is. I'll, get, I'll get this one. You can get the next one. HCC's Northwest Community Learning Gardening Programs continue with something Frank's extremely interested in now that he's a homeowner, plant propagation. Plant propagation, 10 to 1130 a.m. Monday, October the 11th. You can learn all about it. Uh, Frank, you got your notes up? I got them up now. I got okay. them up. Hispanic Heritage Month continues, Frank. Absolutely. So HCC Student Life Hispanic Heritage Month events are ongoing right now. So starting with the reggaeton dance class. So, you know, a little bit one, two step, you know what I'm saying? So learn new reggaeton dance moves with a company from your own couch. 6 p.m. Wednesday, October 13th, and it's virtual. So for more info on these uh, events, email hcc.studentlife at hcs.edu. Okay, looking to uh, move on from HCC to another college? Well, we've got a transfer fair available for you. That's right, it's that time of year where students can learn all about our partnering universities and uh, colleges. Uh, HCC's transfer fairs are back on campus, allowing students to interact directly with representatives from several of our university partners at our at their own home campus. Several HCC campus locations will offer these transfer fairs. If you want to know more, go to hccs.edu slash transfer fair. It's happening through October the 14th. Okay, I want to skip on down because we're uh, in the sake of time. Uh, talk about um, registering for fall shortened classes. If you want to register, Time's running out. I mean, we're we're in the midst of the fall right now. Uh, you can always register for shortened programs. I think the next one starts on October the 18th. And uh, you can register online anytime, online on a schedule. Those are both completely virtual. Or you can take hybrid courses, with a, which is a mixture of in-person and virtual or in-person classes where you can go to classes. Yeah, those return this week. And we also have a hybrid lab course, which is a mixture of both. To break it down, to learn more, and to get a jump start on the spring registration, learn all about spring. We're going to have registration for that in a few weeks, but go to hccs.edu slash now to get started. Okay, Frank, been a big week in the, in the uh, sports world. First things first, 
Uh, Houston Astros, congratulations. You're in the playoffs. You got one game down. What's game two looking like, Frank? Uh, I think Chicago even, even up the series. I think it's okay. going to go seven. I think the, I think that these teams are evenly matched. Um, you know, the Astros' uh, strength is a, is a hitting, and uh, and and their and the especially the infield power with Alvarez, well, outfield power with Alvarez and Tucker and those guys, and the Chicago White Sox' strength is the starting pitching. Yeah. So um, I think it's going to go. It's going to be a back and forth series, I believe. Um, well, we're going to see later on today. The Astros could take two. Who knows? Who knows? Um, but yeah, it could be a long series. So it only goes five games, folks. So we'll know one way or another if the Astros are moving on. Good luck to them. And hey, congratulations to the Houston Cougars. Five in one, baby. Five and one. They lost that first game against Texas Tech, but they've just been on a rampage since then. Their defense is the real thing. Yeah, the first half, it was kind of sluggish offensively. In the second half, they just took off. Um, I think they yeah. realized that, you know what? Tulane can't play with us. Let's yeah. wake up. <laughs> I think they off. went into that game with, uh, you know, we're going to win. And uh, we don't, you know, we just need to show up. And you don't win game. Look what Tulane did to OU. They gave them a heck of a fight as well. So um, OU's a pretty good team. By the way, we beat them a few years ago, and you know, anyway, that we'll we'll let that go. Uh, and uh, other things too, Frank. Um, so uh, the football world, the Texans, biggest dumpster fire going in town right now. I mean, you uh, they should really uh, wholesale dumpster fires available for the Texans. I don't know what. Well, we know what the Texans are doing, but what's your take on their uh, season so far? I mean, they're doing. I mean, it was on accident because they they originally planned for Tyrod Taylor to play. Um, but you know, I, I, I feel for the safety of Davis Mills. I don't, that, that team is underwhelming. It, it's underwhelming at best. The offensive lines it has issues. Yeah. And I don't know if you're doing Davis Mills a solid by letting him play and get beat up week after week after week. Yeah. We saw 18 years ago, what happened to, to David Carr and he was never the same. Yeah. I really believe if you're going to play a quarterback, you need to play a veteran who was a middling veteran, like to the point where they're not going to really move the mini needle um, and, and still can probably just lose and get a top five pick for next year. But I don't like what's going on with Davis Mills. I watched that Bills game, Todd, last week. And, uh, well, what I could watch. That was and terrible. He looks, he looks overwhelmed. He looks well, like shell shocked. I and, know they had a late pick, but let's face it. You pick a quarterback who started – what, not even a dozen college games. And in the college games, he was underwhelming. What are you thinking you're going to get? You know, you got a third round pick who probably should have been a sixth round or a free agent, realistically. And uh, you, you spin the dice and here you pick Tyrod Taylor, who was phenomenal when he started. He can't stay healthy for the life of the poor guy. But uh, yeah, that's kind of where they are right now. Yeah, yeah, and I don't, you know, when, when you look across the landscape, you look at J.J. Watt and and, and and Hopkins in Arizona, you look yeah, at... Number one team in the NFL, by the way. Yeah, I mean, all the former Texans are doing very, very well. Um, yeah. You know, J.R. Reader in Cincinnati, they're 3-1, they're <laughs> so... Um, Unbelievable. I mean, in the Texans... They just keep texting. There you go. All right, folks, we're going to wrap up. Uh, next week, Chief Offer, Entrepreneurial Initiatives Officer Maya Dernovo joins us, and we'll also have several other guests. Thanks for being here today. Frank, always good to see you. We'll see you next week. Always a pleasure, boss man. All right, and we'll see all of you Monday live right here at 10 a.m. up to the minute.